how to successfully culture a BioGaia gastris L. ruteri probiotic in a home kitchen through a yogurt medium. Now, please note, this is not going to be an L. ruteri recipe tutorial, but rather a deep dive in L. ruteri as a probiotic and as a microbe. When we understand L. ruteri better as a microbe, it'll be much easier to develop a successful L. ruteri yogurt recipe. This way, you'll be able to identify what does and does not work for L. ruteri to successfully be cultured in a home kitchen. In this video, I'm going to go over maybe some common pitfalls, such as using inulin or not, I personally do not, and using potato starch or not, I do not. Now, to actually be helpful, in the description of this video, you'll be able to find my link to a blog post where I cite what I'm using and where I provide my own personal El Bruderite yogurt recipes. I'm well aware that there are a multitude of recipes out there that do work. This is just my iteration and my personal contribution to the El Bruderai slash probiotic community so that I can actually be helpful for those who are interested. Now, without further ado, let's dive in. There is one incredibly important thing that I really want to press upon, and that is these El Ruderi are not like the other El Ruderi on the market. Why is that? The BioGaia, uh, in the ingredients, you're going to see El Ruderi DSM17938. You're also going to see El Ruderi ATCC PTA6475. What does that mean? The ATCCPTA stands for American Type Culture Collection, which is a business that holds cultures. And then the PTA is a Patent Transfer Accession, AKA the L. ruteri here is patented. You cannot find any other type of supplement that contains this specific strain of L. ruteri, full stop, no exceptions, it's patented. When you go into the other one, the DSM, that is the German equivalent of the American type culture collection. And so what that means is that both of these are patented L. ruteri strains. How does that happen? What they do is they take a classic L. ruteri, so the form L. ruteri DSM17938 is derived from L. ruteri ATCC55730. Uh, but they removed the antibiotic resistant gene, which means that this L. ruteri, the specific patented strain, makes it so that it survives the acidity in the stomach and it makes it all the way to the gut microbiome. What that means essentially is that this is a more robust and will be a more effective type of probiotic to use in a nutritional protocol for any reason that you're using this. Furthermore, and kind of unfortunately, but logically, because this is a patent, they're not going to just give you all of their information on what they did regarding these microbes. They are going to have its private information, which means it's not public domain, which means that when we go into back dive and we start to look at the physiological preferences of these bacteria, we will not be able to find the information for this specific strain because that is patent, secret, confidential information. What we can do is that we can look up the species of this L. ruteri and we can make inferences as to what will work. When you look up the name and taxonomic classification of a microbe, usually the more, the farther down you get, the more specific you get in the type of temperature, oxygen, and food source preferences. So if you look at a certain probiotics or a microbes genus or species, you can get generally a very good idea of what this bacteria is going to prefer as we go to culture it in our home kitchen. All right, so let me show you how I would go about doing this. So first I would go to back dive and I would look up ruteri. I would click on the first one, and then we're going to get a list of hits. In these hits, you're going to get uh, more or less information. The more information, the better, because it's going to help you make correct decisions, and it's gonna give you more information as to how it would be better to multiply it and have this strain in your home kitchen. So here, compared to the other ones, we have more strain numbers, and we have 
uh, just more information. And so that one can be really helpful. If you go further down, you'll see other ones that have a green check as well. But uh, these are subspecies, so they're not actually going to be as helpful. Uh, and then maybe you don't know where it's coming from. Uh, so we're going to go somewhere that is a little bit more general. So let's click on this one. And what we can see is that this L. ruteri strain is from the intestine of an adult. And so that is really reassuring because we are adults here, we are human, and we're not pigs, we're not you know, any other kind of like lab animal that they may have used. We know that this bacteria, this approach, is going to work in the human body. And so that one all by itself is a really good uh, factor to take in. So when we go down uh, species, uh, El Bruderai, and then we are going to look at culture and growth conditions. Uh, you're going to see the mediums that they use, and you're going to see the temperature ranges that, they, that the microbe prefers. So when you go here, you can see that the microbe did grow at 37 degrees Celsius, uh, and there are multiple uh, statements saying that it did grow in that temperature. It did not grow in 10, 15, or 22. What that means is that if you try to ferment this at room temperature, it will not grow. It Straight up, it will not grow. But, so let's talk about that real quick. If I am trying to have a gut microbe, I am a human being, I am alive, it is warm, I am warm, I am, you know, I'm not dead, I'm 37 degrees Celsius and my gut is an anaerobic environment. It has no oxygen in it and so it is closed, it is dark, and it is 37 degrees Celsius. That means that the bacteria, the bacteria that I introduced that survive well in those conditions will be able to inoculate my gut and will be able to stay there. And so that is what we are looking for. We're looking for gut microbes that like the home environment of a naturally warm gut. Keep that in mind. So next, what we're going to look up, so we know the temperature range. Now let's look at food sources or let's look at oxygen sources. So oxygen tolerance, it says, the first one says anaerobe, so no oxygen. Next one says micro aerophil, which means that it, pro that it likes a very little bit of oxygen. And the next one says facultative anaerobe, and so that it can do well in a non-oxygen environment. What this is telling us is that it doesn't want to have an abundance of oxygen. If I were to leave it out, it would not survive or it would not proliferate. This microbe does well when there is little to no oxygen available for it, which means it ferments. Next, going down, we're going to see metabolite utilization. Metabolite, does the l ruteri, does the microbe eat any of these types of sugars and does it make acid from it? Does it build acid? So for example, if we look up the D fucose, uh, there is a negative and so it does not build acid. The l ruteri does not use this type of metabolite. If we keep clicking and we go farther down, we will see what the l ruteri can use. So galactose, which is a type of sugar from milk, so we know that milk is probably a good source. Glucose, there's also a positive, build acid from, and so glucose plus galactose equals lactose, so good, it means a milk medium would be a good idea. Build acid from your semi-neutral in pH milk, which is about I'd say 6.5 in pH, it's a little bit acidic. Uh, it will uh, technically, if I put a wood rye in a milk medium, it will take that 6.5 pH and it will further acidify it. Yogurt is usually around a 4.5 and that's a good range. Uh, uh, traditional yogurt, a wood rye yogurt, maybe it'll come down to like, uh, like a five, but if it's going more acidic, that is a good sign that it is working. So. Farther down, let's keep going. Uh, mannitol, it does not use. Ribose, it does use. It does not use sorbitol. Uh, and as we go down, so we will see, and this one is super important, and I see a lot of confusion in this area, and as a dietitian and as a microbiology fermentation lover, uh, 
this is something, this is a mistake that I'm seeing. And inulin. So what is inulin? Inulin are chains of fructose molecules and l ruteri does not eat inulin. Full stop. It does not, it does not eat inulin. What is inulin? It is a chain of fructose molecules. The l ruteri cannot have that. It will not do anything with it and it's not helpful. If you are putting inulin in your milk medium, you are not providing a food source for those microbes. Inulin does help microbes in a general sense. It is a prebiotic fiber, and so it can help certain microbes survive longer. But is it a direct food for L. ruteri to survive? No. So, I digress. Anyway, uh, next, let's keep scrolling down. What also does it use? So it does use lactose, so good. That reinforces our milk medium. What that also does is it tells us if we use a milk medium, we can add more milk powder to give our uh, milk more lactose, more food for the uh, microbes to use and enjoy. Uh, next, it does use uh, nitrates, and it does uh, oh, and it does create respiration. So it would it would then create bubbles. So if you were to have it, when you look on the side of a yogurt jar, usually, and you're making traditional yogurt, not a red yogurt, but traditional yogurt, you would see lines come up, and that is from respiration of it actually happening. Uh, that's something different for another experiment, um, and and of course it it will easily eat sucrose. So maybe there's a conversation for like adding honey or something like that, but you don't really need to. You could technically add maybe like dextrose, which is a uh, pure sugar. But when we go farther down, we will see a, here, we will see this. So these are all uh, references. Did the l ferment? Did it actually work and consume these molecules? And so here you'll see acid, acid from D-ribose, uh, galactose, glucose. Only once did it actually eat fructose. So fructose is not a good food source for l ruteri. If we go farther, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to kind of right here, inulin. In zero cases, cases did inulin actually feed l ruteri? That is super important and people need to realize this. Next, uh, maltose, uh, lactose, it fed off of lactose every single time. Um, and you can order any of these specific ones separately. So if you want to get like a pure, you know, maltose powder, you could do that and add it to your medium if you want. Not necessary. Milk with milk powder is perfectly fine. Clearly, l Rite feeds off of those things. Furthermore, now this you'll know if you start to understand fermentation as a whole, uh, you do not ever get microbes that eat fat. Fat is a texture thing. And so what that means is heavy cream or adding fat to something will help with texture, but it will not ever ferment. Fat does not ferment. Fat uh, will not provide a food source for the microbes. So if you are wanting the microbes to be happy and to survive well, you want to give them carbs. They, they like specific carbs. And so what we're seeing here is that they technically really like milk and milk sugars uh, and then glucose, uh, etc. So would it be wise to add heavy cream? Maybe in the beginning, no, but it can be helpful for texture for when you're eating this afterwards. Okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, so then if you keep scrolling down, you will get more information about where this is found, intestine of adults. If you want to learn more, the information is right there. And I feel like some people want to look at the research for a ruteri and not look at these very generic internet resources. These are the scientific sources that you can easily access and they're incredibly helpful. Farther down in the literature, you can see, you know, how it works in a type of like health aspect and 
as well all of the references. And so hopefully, hopefully this is helpful for understanding what it is that albuterai would prefer as a food source in the profile of albuterai as a microbe and probiotic that we want to introduce into our gut. So to summarize, what I would do is if I wanted to create a home albuterai culture in my kitchen is I would get milk and I would get whole, I would get whole milk. I would add in maybe extra milk powder, maybe one tablespoon per cup. So if I'm using like a liter or a quart of milk, I would add in a quarter cup to all of that. So one tablespoon per cup, uh, four tablespoons is about one quarter cup to have extra lactose to feed the microbes. I would grab that milk. I would heat it up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. I would pasteurize it. And then I would cool it down to body temperature because that's the temperature range that these microbes actually like. Uh, so 37 degrees Celsius, 98.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I would add my probiotics, my crushed up probiotics to that milk medium, that whole milk that's been heated then cooled, that has that added milk powder. I would create a sealed uh, environment so that it is anaerobic, just like the gut that has that is anaerobic as well. The gut has no oxygen in it. And then I would let it sit until uh, it has properly acidified. I would grab a pH strip and I would test the pH. If the pH is at around like a five or lower, I think that would be a really good sign that the fermentation has worked. That being said, always, 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 these bacteria, these microbes from capsule, they're going to have a lag phase. They're always going to be a waking up phase. So usually your first batch is going to be maybe slightly grainy or it may have not the best texture. But what you're doing is you are telling these bacteria, I want you to metabolize lactose. It's time to wake up and it's time to go to work. And then your future batches will work better every single time. But there is always a lag phase. So if your first try was not successful, it does not mean that you did not do it correctly. It means that your bacteria are waking up and they're getting used to the environment that you are using. All right, so that has been my personal approach as to how I would take a probiotic and I would culture it in my home kitchen. Stick around for a future video where I actually show you my walkthrough on how I would do this using the milk and the milk powder with my albuterai and my home yogurt culture setup. If you like this video, please show it some love, give it a like and subscribe. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the comment section below. As always, you can find everything that I talked about in the description. And uh, I would like to thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.